Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Happy Monday um, and happy Constitution Day. Uh, my name is Ed Cabellan. I'm the Vice President for Student Services and Enrollment Management here at Bristol Community College. It's my pleasure to welcome you all here as well as our other campus locations that are watching from, uh, from New Bedford and Attleboro. Uh, as well as Taunton. And so thanks uh, to our student life team for pulling this event together. Kathy Burns, our director, thank you very much. We appreciate it. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this morning and to uh, present our guest speaker, attorney Bob Thomas. Bob is a 1985 graduate of Harvard Law School and has had an interesting and diverse career. Uh, he's practiced law in three different cities, Washington, D.C., Baltimore, and Boston. He's been in private practice in government service as an assistant U.S. attorney prosecuting fraud cases, and has been special counsel to the labor union fighting corruption and even special counsel to the Boston Red Sox during the 2007 and 2008 seasons. They're having a good year this year, so it's good. Uh, Bob currently makes his living representing whistleblowers in complex fraud cases involving government contracts. He's the co-founder and ma managing partner of the Whistleblower Law Collective, a Boston firm that exclusively works on representing whistleblowers who are aware of fraud against government programs like Medicare and Medicaid, or of tax evasion or of violations to the country's security laws. Just over a year ago, he and his partner represented the whistleblower in the, in the Milan Epi Pen case, which returned $465 million back to taxpayers. Last fall, Bob and his partner were honored with the prestigious Whistleblower Lawyer of the Year Award uh, by the nonprofit Taxpayers Against Fraud in recognition of their work fighting fraud over the last two decades. When he's not being a whistleblower lawyer, Bob teaches healthcare fraud and abuse at Boston University Law School, a popular course that he's taught for eight years. He's also taught courses on financial literacy to the high school age students of Beacon Academy. But the reason we have Bob here to talk to us today about, is about his passion about the US Constitution. Bob is a board member of the Massachusetts chapter of the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union which defends our constitutional rights, particularly the Bill of Rights. He feels that this is, this is a particularly vulnerable time for our nation, as the rule of law is under attack almost daily, and hard-fought constitutional rights are being undermined on a regular basis. So Bob is here to give us some context on the Constitution and why it matters and why it should be celebrated and why it should be defended. Please help me in, in welcoming um, Mr. Thomas to Bristol Community College. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. How are you? Happy Monday morning to you. And thank you, Ed, for the introduction. Thank you, Kathy, we for. Understood. And thank you, Kathy, for arranging this on such short notice. And thank all of you for being here. I know some of you are uh, in class, so you didn't have an option. But uh, just the same, it's nice to see you. Uh, uh, not fun to speak to an empty uh, auditorium. So, so thank you very, very much. Um, uh, that was a, a fairly thorough uh, background on me, and I don't want to spend much time talking about what I do uh, professionally because um, this topic is really slightly apart from what I do professionally, but it is an area of, of deep interest uh, of mine for quite a long time, and that's, as Ed mentioned, why I'm uh, on the board of the ACLU. Um, but I want this to be as interactive a session as we can make it, and I particularly want to uh, see if you all have questions or thoughts or ideas. So I don't mind being interrupted. I actually like being interrupted. Um, and I will uh, absolutely save time at the end uh, if people have questions. Um, so um, with that uh, background, let me um, just start off by saying one of the reasons I jumped at the opportunity uh, to give this talk is that um, I've noticed over the years that um, we don't teach civics as much in this country as we did a few generations ago. and. Uh, in general, uh, I think this is literally true, we know more about the American Idol candidates than we know about our presidential candidates. Um, and when you ask people, you know, what do they know about the person who's uh, trying to win the prize for singing, we have all sorts of details uh, that we can say about that. But then if you ask them, well, what do the presidential candidates uh, have to say about things, we, we know a little less about that. So, so we have become kind of an entertainment culture, and that uh, means that what we hold in our minds as citizens about uh, how the government works, uh, who's doing what in the government, 
um, why it all matters, um, is a little less front and center uh, with each successive generation. And so um, to tr I, I've noticed that some of the problems that we get into as a society have, be have been really because of civic illiteracy about uh, how our government works and uh, what we as citizens can do about it. And so uh, it's a great opportunity um, to, I mean, Congress has mandated that the public uh, colleges and universities uh, take uh, an observation of the Constitution on this particular day, the day that it was ratified, um, to try to remedy uh, that problem and to get us a little more uh, literate about what the Constitution is, what it does, what it doesn't do, and what we can do as, as citizens. Um, so that's the, um, that's the context, and let me just, I have a few PowerPoint slides that'll sort of aid our, uh, our conversation here. So, so, so what is this thing, and what's uh, the big deal about it? Well, the first thing uh, that I would say in terms of why this is a big deal is this was the first time uh, a country in Western civilization, certainly a country of this size, had engaged in the exercise of self-government. We were coming out of the European experience, uh, at least the Europeans who were arriving here in North America. We were not the first Americans, as you know. Uh, but the colonists, the British colonists, were um, uh, very much of the tradition in Europe, which was the divine right of kings. And what had been the law of the land in Europe for many centuries had been that kings had the divine right. They were supposed uh, to, be, uh, to derive their power from God. Uh, and, and therefore, the, with this divine right of kings, they could do as they pleased. And they had so what was called sovereign immunity. They couldn't be sued. They couldn't be answerable to anyone uh, but God. And uh, needless to say, uh, that uh, led to many injustices and forms of despotism. And it was that uh, reality that caused the American Revolution to happen. But while there have been many constitutions since the American Constitution was drafted, this was basically writing on a clean slate. No one had ever done this before. So you had a group of people pulling themselves together to get in rooms and talk about, well, how are we going to organize ourselves? How are we actually going to do this? We have, we have thrown off uh, the yoke of uh, the British monarchy. Now, how are we going to organize our affairs? And that may sound simple uh, in the context of knowing what we know now, but imagine if you've been um, living under 500 years of the divine right of kings, the whole notion of self-government was radical. Um, and the mechanics of how we go about doing it um, was certainly an unknown thing. So that's uh, the first uh, aspect of what uh, was, uh, of why this is an important document. Um, this was also, the, uh, the other, another aspect of why this is a big deal is what the founders were trying to do was create a blueprint. They were trying to create a map and it was a very delicate exercise because they wanted to be specific enough to get their points across and set up the structure of government, but they wanted it to be flexible enough in the joints so that this document could last over multiple generations. And so if they had legislated precisely in language that would have made sense intimate sense in 1789, it might not have made so much sense in 2018. And so there's a number of instances in the Constitution where the language is a little ambiguous or a little pliable, and that was intentional because there was this understanding that there, was, there were to be evolving standards of what these words mean and what our society would require. So it was an extraordinary act of draftsmanship to be specific enough to set up the structure, um, but vague enough to allow successive generations to interpret the document as they went along. And this is why the Supreme Court is so important, because as these generations go by and these interpretations happen, it is the courts who are uh, guiding uh, that process. Um, so to drive this point home in terms of how unique this experiment was in self-government. Um, it was 74 years later, in 1863, 
at the Gettysburg Address, one of the most famous speeches by any American president, that at the, at the consecration of the Gettysburg burial ground, uh, Abraham Lincoln, um, among other things, said, the whole point of this struggle is to determine whether self-government is a reality or not, whether government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall perish from the earth or not. He said, basically, that's what this struggle is about. Can constitutional democracy survive? So that, among other things, drives home the point that this was by no means a foregone conclusion that this would succeed. It's, when you look at history backwards, you say, oh, of course, they drafted this, and it all worked out, and we had a civil war, and one side won, and this is what we have. Um, but if you were back there looking forward, that's obviously completely different. And there, 74 years later, in the middle of the United States Civil War, uh, an American president, the 16th president, is still saying what we're testing here is wh whether the idea of self-government is a joke or not. Um, and so the language of the Constitution and whether it can hold together uh, is and was an experiment uh, that is still going on 229 years later. It's an experiment that we want very much to succeed, and it's dependent on citizens, you and me, to make sure that it does, because without that, it's just a piece of paper, okay? Um, all right, let's see here. All right, so what does it actually do? <clears throat> First thing that many of us may not be fully aware of is the Constitution was not our original governmental document. In your little pamphlet, if you take it on the way out, you'll see um, at page 67, there's something called the Articles of Confederation. So when the country broke away from England, it was really 13 colonies, 13 colonies that thought of themselves as sovereign states. So 80 years later, when there's a civil war, people in the South fought for their states, thought that states were their primary loyalty as opposed to the federal government. So the question of what is the governmental body, what is the, the state that to whom I owe allegiance was still very much uh, an open question. At the founding of the country, uh, with the Articles of Confederation, uh, what people thought was, I, I'm a Marylander. I'm a Massachusettsian, if that's the right word. Uh, I'm a Rhode Islander, uh, and so forth. They didn't really think uh, so much in terms of, I'm a, I'm a citizen of the United States. And the Articles of Confederation was, just as the name would suggest, a very loose alliance, a loose confederation of uh, so uh, sovereign states, states that thought they were uh, sovereign uh, nations in effect. Well, the problem with that, as you might imagine, is what happens when Maryland and Virginia start fighting over commercial fishing rights in the Chesapeake Bay? What happens when uh, there's a war and we need to raise money for uh, military forces? Um, any number of things that the federal government now uh, handles, uh, there was no strong central government. So it took only a matter of a few years before people realized, you know, this isn't working. Uh, England is um, knocking on the door, would love to rewrite the ending of the American Revolution. Um, we have no navy, we have no army, we can't pay our war debts. Um, and things were falling apart quickly. And also states were squabbling and there was no one to mediate those disputes. So within only a few years, um, the group of founders got together and basically uh, did a do-over. They, they rewrote uh, the entire structure of our government and that's the one that we have today under the Constitution. So the first thing that the Constitution does is it basically just establishes the structure of our government, the three branches of government. I'm not going to insult your intelligence by telling you what they are. You know that already. Um, but it establishes the structure uh, of the government with those three branches. Um, it creates specific duties and responsibilities. It enumerates those uh, duties and responsibilities in ways that provided checks and balances um, against each other. Because one of the really highly intelligent things 
things that the founders did was they understood human nature well enough to know that power corrupts and we need to be wary of the concentration of power. Footnote, right now we are in a period of essentially one party government and it's a, for you to decide uh, whether you think Congress is doing its job where the courts are doing its job in uh, defending some of these principles uh, when the executive is saying things like, the press is the enemy of the people. Uh, that's the kind of statement that deserves a response. And where are the other branches of government in terms of checking that, that type of statement? Um, and if anyone's getting bored, we can just imagine the basketball going on next door, right? <laughs> is that what that is? <laughs> No, That's quite all right. No, don't. You're doing the four of the things. Got it. Um, all right. So in addition, so so checks and balances. So for example, um, Congress can pass a law. President can veto a law. If Congress doesn't like that veto, Congress with enough votes can override the veto and make it law anyway. Okay. Congress can pass a law and the president can sign a law and the courts can hold that law unconstitutional. Um, the president gets to nominate Supreme Court justices, but only with the advice and consent of the Senate. So you have a whole list of functions here where each branch has to rely a little bit on the cooperation and vote of the other branches. And that was, an, the idea there was they didn't want too much concentration of power. Now as events have unfolded in our nation's history, the president, the, the office of the presidency has acquired greater and greater power. Um, and that's one of the reasons why the other branches need to take seriously their enumerated powers to uh, serve as a check and balance on, on executive power. All right. Um, it also provides specific protections for individuals from government power. So if you look at the first bullet point, it creates the structure of government. But then in the first 10 amendments, known as the Bill of Rights, which passed a couple of years after the Constitution passed, um, it also sets forth individual protections that we have against government power. And when people think about constitutional rights, this is what they are typically thinking of, the Bill of Rights, um, freedom of speech. Um, the right to bear arms, the freedom to be free of uh, unreasonable searches and seizures, uh, the, um, the right to be uh, free from cruel and unusual punishments, the right to a jury trial. Those are all uh, enumerated in the first 10 amendments. And, and that was perhaps the most unique uh, feature of the document because if you go back to the Declaration of Independence before the Constitution, what was radical about that statement to the king, and remember we were colonists, we were subjects of the king, and the Declaration of uh, Independence says to the king, we hold certain truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and that the power of the sovereign is actually uh, derived from the consent of the governed. The, that was a radical notion. So the this idea that there are human rights, we hear that term all the time today, that was an unknown radical concept at the time. The notion that individual people have the right to be free of, of unreasonable government power. That sounds like a non-controversial thing today. That was a radical, radical thought at the time. So now in the, the first 10 amendments, one thing that many people don't understand about uh, how this works, the Constitution was defining the scope and power of the federal government. It was not defining the scope and power of the state governments. Each state had its own state constitution. All right. So if you go to the First Amendment, it says Congress shall pass no law abridging freedom of speech. So if your mother says be quiet at the dinner table, you don't say, I have a free speech right. You can't, you know, it applies to Congress, okay? It doesn't apply to your employer. If your employer says, stop talking politics at the workplace, it's distracting to everybody. 
um, you might think, well, I have a free speech right. Well, you have a free speech right as it applies to Congress. Okay. Now, a century later, after the Civil War amendments, which we'll talk about, it also applies to the state. So it applies to all state action. So the city council, city council or the state legislature or Congress can't restrict your speech, but your mother can restrict your speech, your employer can restrict your speech, your spouse, and so forth. Okay? Uh, right, Polly? <laughs> uh, all right. So what else does the Constitution do? So the Civil War amendments, which come at the conclusion of the Civil War, um, there's sort of an interesting um, role reversal, in, in a sense. At the founding of the government, the concern in the Bill of Rights was, we are nervous about a big, centralized, federal, powerful government. We've just had this experience with the King of England. We don't want to repeat that. We don't want a King of America. There were some suggestions that the executive office ought to be called king. Um, we don't want that much concentration of power. And the Bill of Rights was designed to protect citizens against that, that idea of uh, all-powerful federal government. Fast forward 80 years, the country is falling apart over the issue of slavery. Okay? And what happens as the, as the Union wins that war it now is in a position of enforcing the point of the war, which was the, not only the abolition of slavery, but the guarantee of certain rights, like the right to vote, like the right to free speech, like the right to participate in American life as a free and equal citizen. Well, so the 13th, the 13th Amendment abolishes slavery, 14th Amendment establishes the Equal Protection Clause, and the 15th Amendment establishes the right to vote. Um, these are called the Civil War Amendments, uh, sometimes called the Second Bill of Rights. So here, the federal government is not um, the bad guy. Uh, here, the federal government is the guarantor of individual rights as against state governments. Okay, so the idea is, state governments that are saying slavery is okay, state governments that are saying uh, people of dark skin color can't vote and can be owned and bought and sold, and state governments that passed Jim Crow laws after the Civil War, uh, those uh, are subject to federal enforcement. The feds, having won the war, uh, can basically tell a state government, no, you have to let uh, black people vote. Uh, you have to let people assemble. You have to let you have to let people, all people, enjoy the same privileges and immunities as everyone else. Um, now, they wrote that down in 1865 and 1867 and 1868 successively, and then in 1876 they promptly forgot about that for about 90 years. So we went through a very ugly, dark period where those amendments were not enforced. Civil rights movement in the 1960s was basically an effort to hold the country accountable to what it said it was going to do in the 1860s. Okay? So that was the whole period of Jim Crow and the, and, um, the resurgency of some of those uh, segregation laws in the South. Um, okay, so that's the second Bill of Rights. Um, and as I said, now the feds are not the one uh, being policed. Uh, it's the states, the mischievous uh, states being policed by the feds. Okay. All right. How does it relate to other laws? I mean, I think this is absolutely bedrock. You, you need to know this if you, need, if you need anything from this talk. How does the Constitution relate to the thousands and thousands and thousands of other laws and regulations and city council ordinances that pass in the country. Um, so let me, before I answer the question, let me just give you some hypotheticals. Your city council says, we're tired of these people saying Occupy Wall Street uh, or Black Lives Matter or you know, pick your favorite cause. Um, we're gonna pass a law saying no, press, no protesting. No protesting, it's just you can't do it. I'm not going to allow you to protest, period. Okay? Or okay, well, can they do that? What do you think? Okay, good. Uh, suppose ICE says uh, all Muslims must leave the U.S. 
Hmm, interesting. Suppose ICE says all people of Latin American descent must leave the U.S. Suppose the president says only Fox News shall be allowed to uh, broadcast news. Suppose the president says uh, I'm shutting down the New York Times. I'm calling in the army. I'm shutting down the New York Times. Deal with it. Um, and by the way, I see, I'm glad I see some people shaking their heads. Um, but don't think this doesn't happen in the world, right? There are countries with constitutions that call themselves democracies where these things happen. And if there's anything I can leave you with, it is the notion that don't think it can't happen here, <laughs> all right? Anything can happen if a population is asleep at the switch. So these things may sound crazy and blatantly unconstitutional, and they pretty much are, um, but we stop these things by being vigilant and speaking up, uh, okay? So let me give you a few others. Uh, Congress says gay people can't marry. The state legislature outlaws gun ownership. The president and Congress pass a law criminalizing any criticism of the president. Now, you might think of that in terms of today's president, but a very revered uh, second president of the United States, John Adams of Massachusetts, the author of the Massachusetts Constitution, was so prickly about criticism. Um, and the criticism back in that era was at least as nasty as today's. Um, that he got passed a criminal, a series of criminal laws called the Alien and Sedition Acts, which made it illegal, criminally illegal, to criticize the president. So this has happened, okay? Now, that, uh, before it could be struck down, um, it had a limited duration. It was, uh, get this, it was made applicable only for the period of years that John Adams was president. So uh, Congress, in its wisdom, let that lapse. Jefferson came in and no one talked about uh, re-upping the Alien and Seditions Act, Sedition Act. But it was John Adams' uh, worst mistake, I would say, of his life. Um, because obviously this is blatantly unconstitutional on the, under the First Amendment. And yet it passed Congress and was signed into law. And there were publishers who went to prison uh, for publishing criticisms of John Adams. OK. Um, the city council says, hey, we got a crime problem. Uh, we're going to get rid of the warrant requirement. And police can just search wherever they need to search. They don't need, OK? These are examples of ideas that people have had or could have uh, that would, I think from the nods I'm getting in the room, uh, would violate the Constitution. So when there's a collision, the supremacy clause of the Constitution answers the question. It says, no, no, no. The Constitution is the supreme law of the land. So any state or federal law or regulation or ordinance that passes that is in violation or, or in contradiction of the Constitution um, is essentially void. Footnote. There are lots of things that pass that are probably unconstitutional, but they don't get ruled unconstitutional unless someone challenges them. Okay, so there ha the judges don't have the right to just run barefoot through the law books. Okay, they need a case or controversy to come to them in a lawsuit. So that's why organizations like the ACLU are often bringing suit um, to bring an issue in front of the court so that they can hold something unconstitutional. Um, and without an actual case or controversy, as it's called, the judiciary doesn't have any ju jurisdiction to declare something unconstitutional. Um, but obviously, people know this. And so there are people uh, on alert to challenge things when they think they're unconstitutional. Um, all right. So the Constitution wins. Judicial review is the concept that came out of an early case called Marbury versus Madison. Um, and in the beginning, the founders, I don't think, really thought they knew whether the judiciary would, in fact, be a co-equal branch of government. And it 
is a sort of open to historical debate whether they really envisioned it to be as uh, powerful as it has become. Um, but the interesting thing about this case uh, was that um, Mr. Marbury was a, a midnight appointment uh, by John Adams. Uh, John Adams was a Federalist. The incoming president was Thomas Jefferson, who was an anti-Federalist. So this was the beginning of the two-party system. And on his way out the door, John Adams wrote a number of federal appointments, including Mr. Marbury. Um, and in his haste to get out of town, he certainly didn't want to witness his rival's inauguration, so he was bolting out the door. He left these assigned appointments on Jefferson's desk, uh, undelivered. <laughs> and so Mr. Marbury wanted that job, um, but the writ never came. Uh, and so he sued. Uh, he sued uh, Jefferson's Secretary of State, um, James Madison, uh, and said, give me that commission. I want that job. And it goes to the court. So now you've got a case for controversy. And uh, in, that, in that case, uh, the court ultimately held that the law that um, John Adams was appointing this, um, this judicial position to, uh, Mr. Marbury to, uh, was unconstitutional. So it established this notion that the judges, the Supreme Court or the lower federal courts, can declare laws unconstitutional. In other words, unenforceable. They're struck down. So even though Congress has passed them and the president has signed them, the judiciary, if they have the opportunity in the right case or controversy, can say, no, that law is no good, or that part of that law is no good. Um, and that has lived with us ever since, and it's why the Supreme Court nominations that we're living through right now are so important, because the court is deeply divided uh, on partisan grounds, and it's a very close split, and they're interpreting all these laws and determining what's constitutional and what's not. All right, am I making sense so far? Okay, great. All right, so to try to keep this lively, I thought, you know, David Letterman used to do a top 10 list, and I thought, well, maybe I can do a, a top 10 list of things that you really need to know, sort of uh, fun, fun facts to know and tell. All right, so the 10 things you really need to know about the Constitution, and then when I get to the end of this, we'll open it up for questions, and I hope you can quiz me and stump me and have whatever fun you want. All right, the first thing is, it's not the same thing as the Declaration of Independence. Declaration of Independence is 1776. It's what starts our revolution. It's the kickoff moment of saying to the King of England, sorry, we're not gonna take any more of this. Um, and it is an aspirational statement. It's a statement of human rights th that about the, the inherent rights of human beings to be free, to be equal, to govern their own affairs. Now, we all know that in 1776, uh, the colonies weren't really living into that. Um, all men are created equal. Wow. Um, okay, we're not allowing slaves to participate, we're not allowing women to participate, we're not allowing men of property to participate uh, in terms of voting. So um, all men are created equal in reality <laughs> was about 10% of the population, okay? Um, but as a statement of aspiration, uh, it still today remains uh, this powerful statement of what we are aiming for, okay? Um, the Constitution, by contrast, is much less of, a, of an aspirational document. It is more of a nuts and bolts, um, how-to uh, structure of government document. It's got embedded in it a series of compromises, some of them fairly ugly, like how, how are we gonna vote, uh, how are we gonna count the votes of slaves, um, even though they're not voting, we're gonna wait the representation of the states according to their slave population, even though the slaves can't vote. I mean, there's some very strange things that are embedded in the Constitution because you had 13 different colonies with 13 different points of view on all these things, and some of the compromises are, like many pieces of legislation, not particularly pretty. Um, all right, so the soaring rhetoric that you see in the Declaration of Independence is really absent uh, in the Constitution, except for the preamble, and I'll close with that, because the preamble basically says, you know, this is what we're trying to do here. 
uh, but most of the document is just the nuts and bolts of government and the nuts and bolts of what rights do people have against government power. Okay, that's number one. Number two, um, imagine if right now Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, oh, I don't know, Arnold Schwarzenegger, pick, uh, pick your favorite movie star, uh, got together and said, you know what, this government isn't, isn't working right. Um, you know, Hillary Clinton won the election by three million votes, but somehow she's not president. And we got all sorts of crazy things that aren't working. Let's just get in a conference room and devise a better form of government and then we'll sell it to folks. I mean, that sounds crazy, right? I mean, how, how could that happen? But everybody understood at this time that you know we're writing on a blank slate and the Articles of Confederation have not worked. And I'm overstating things a little bit here because this was not a totally illegal meeting. The states did vote as in their sovereign capacities to send representatives to this meeting. But what is often not talked about is the Continental Congress that came up with the Constitution did so while there was a federal government in place. There was a president of the United States at the time, John Hanson, okay? Uh, he was president under the Articles of Confederation. So there was an existing government at the time. This body, headed by George Washington with all these famous names that you've heard about, was meeting to basically unwind that sitting government and create a new one that would work better. So it's, it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of extraordinary thought that you've got an existing government that is tolerating uh, a private meeting closed to the public uh, where these bigwigs, most of whom are the wealthiest, most powerful people in the country, are getting together trying to figure out uh, how are we gonna reorganize things. Again, another little footnote. We talk about the American Revolution. There were many revolutions, democratic revolutions in other countries that would follow. Most of those were, are what we would call bottom-up revolutions, so popular uprisings. Think in particular of France. You've got a king, you've got policies that are cruel to the poor, uh, people are starving, and basically the peasantry rises up and gets rid of the monarchy. Okay? That's the bottom-up form of revolution. The American Revolution was a top-down revolution. This was not slaves, poor working whites rising up. This was the powerful and the elite uh, of the colonies basically saying, we're tired of other people governing our affairs. We're tired of being taxed. We're tired of uh, having these uh, unrepresentative laws being uh, shoved down our throat. So we think we can do better, and we'd like to organize our own affairs. But George Washington was the wealthiest man in the country at the time, okay? And the people in that room, uh, many of whom were, you know, vast plantation owners who owned slaves and so forth, um, these were wealthy elites uh, that were doing this conversation. And some of the weird embedded things in the Constitution reflect that fact, that these are propertied interests um, that cared about protecting property uh, in a way that you wouldn't see, for example, in the language coming out of the French Revolution. Okay, uh, that's number two. Uh, number three, it's not perfect. <laughs> um, it's really good. It's really good, but it's not perfect. They didn't get everything right. I mentioned the slavery issue. They deliberately uh, bypassed that as too hot to handle, okay? And they left that for another generation, which meant they left it for a civil war. Um, and they, but they have this three-fifths compromise where the southern states said, hey, we don't, if we only count white people's votes, you know, some of these states actually had majority black populations. So if you're not going to count the slaves' vote, the slaves' votes, the southern states are saying we're not going to have many congressmen. Can't have that. On the northern states said, well, so you're going to count every vote of the slaves even though you don't let them vote? That seems a little weird. So in the Constitution, it said, okay, three fifths. We'll count an African American life as three fifths of a life uh, for purposes of assessing uh, how many uh, representatives you get in Congress. That's not a particularly uh, attractive. A compromise that was reached. Um, 
And there were some things that I think have uh, not held up so well under the test of time, the Electoral College being uh, one that I think is uh, problematic right now. The Electoral College was originally conceived as a check on um, uh, the public's, the, the possibility that the public might choose someone um, inappropriate. Um, and if, so there was this concern that, you know, mob rule, the mob might uh, pick someone crazy and we might have a despotic uh, president. So let's have this thing called an electoral college and the states will nominate their wise elder citizens to be a voice of reason. And so this electoral college, even if the people have voted for this uh, despotic person, the electoral college can get together and say, well, no, we don't really think that's appropriate. We'll, we'll vote for someone else. Well, that ceased to function that way when the political parties came into being only a few decades after the country was founded. And so it's no longer a system of wise elders um, exercising an independent vote. It's now just a rubber stamp of whatever party affiliation that elector has. So the Electoral College is a mere formality. Um, and yet, it has fundamentally undemocratic features. So you can have a situation, and we've, I mean, what, two or three of the last five elections have had the winner of the popular vote not become president. Um, so, and in this most recent one, the loser of the popular vote by three million votes um, still became uh, president because of very narrow um, margins in three critical states. So anyway, there are some things that if we could have another constitutional convention, um, which isn't going to happen, um, I think there would be some tweaks that we would like to make. Um, but um, I don't mean to undercut the basic point that it is awfully good. For people who had no guide but their own readings, um, they did an extraordinary job um, with no blueprint. I mean, the constitutions that have been written since then have all built on this and improved on it um, and copied it. But they didn't have that to work with. And in, the fact that it's still functioning 229 years later is a, really quite extraordinary. I mentioned this. It punted on the hardest issue of all. This would never have happened. It would never have passed if they couldn't get the southern states that relied upon slavery for their economic systems uh, to ratify it. So they had to make compromises with slavery. So while there was some discussion of abolition and there was general acknowledgement that this is going to be a problem, they kicked the can down the road because they knew that they would never get this passed if they didn't. Um, and they hoped that the country would sort it out later. Interestingly, in one of the very first uh, Congresses, they passed a statute barring debate on the issue of slavery for a period of decades. So it was not until the 1820s that you were allowed to even discuss the issue of slavery in Congress. And that, as crazy as that sounds, um, the idea behind it, which was probably true, was that if we let the very first or second Congress open that divisive issue up, the country's going to fall apart. And we need to give the country a little bit of time to get its feet on the ground before we reopen that. Um, and that's the way it played out. So in the 1820s, the secessionist crisis uh, of the, in the Jackson presidency uh, surfaces. And that's because, in part, that period of silence was no longer um, mandated by Congress and that these things could be debated. And for the next 30 years, they debated them until they started fighting. Um, so it, it was a punt on the most difficult issue, but it was probably a well thought through punt. Um, we've really talked about this. There are some fundamentally undemocratic things in it. Uh, the Electoral College is uh, certainly one, the compromises over slavery. Um, one that I think the founders would not have fully understood because it was just beyond their ability to comprehend. The smaller states, like our neighbor Rhode Island, were very concerned that the more populous states like New York, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts would outvote people. So if you just had a House of Representatives based on population, what's poor little Rhode Island going to have to say about anything, right? So the states with small, the smaller states said, you know, we got to have some check on New York uh, calling the shots on everything. Um, so 
That's why we have two senators for each state. But fast forward to today. Could the founders have possibly imagined a situation where California would have tens of millions of people and Wyoming would have 600,000, but Wyoming would have the same number of senators as California and Rhode Island would have the same number of senators as New York. So we are just a couple of years away from the notion, okay, you ready for this, where 30% of the population will have 70% of the votes in the Senate. And 70% of the population will have 30% of the votes in the Senate. At a certain point, the things start to break down when a tiny minority, a, a, a shrinking minority can effectively veto anything uh, that uh, the more populous states want to do. So there was an idea behind this that made sense, but as it's evolved, it's become uh, more and more uh, undemocratic. As the populations uh, of the country m go from rural to urban, um, you've got much greater concentration of people on the coasts, which means those central um, uh, states are having uh, less power. Did you have a question? Yeah, okay. Um, all right, so wrapping up here, it has evolved. As you mentioned, some of these words are ambiguous and uh, intentionally so. You'll not find the word privacy in the Constitution. It's not there. But the idea of privacy is there. Freedom from unreasonable searches and seizures, um, freedom to speak your mind, freedom to assemble, um, so Roe v. Wade, the controversial uh, abortion rights opinion, is a basically a privacy-related um, concept and uh, derived under the Constitution. Well, so that's something that the courts did basically through weaving together concepts that are elsewhere in the Constitution to say, no, we think a woman has a privacy interest in her reproductive uh, decisions. Um, and that's nowhere written in the Constitution. That's an evolved understanding of the language. Okay, um, it left some things intentionally ambiguous. It can be amended, but it's really hard to do. It requires uh, that something, the amendment go to the states and that a supermajority of the states uh, pass such amendments, but it's happened 25 times. The first 10 were the Bill of Rights, um, and then uh, the 13th, 14th, and 15th came right after the uh, Civil War. Um, you had the Prohibition Amendment, outlawing alcohol, and then you had the repeal of Prohibition. Um, right now, what a lot of people are talking about is the 25th Amendment, you know, if the president is impaired, and then a lot of people uh, talking about, you know, are, do we have a 25th Amendment uh, uh, situation right now? How would, how would that play out? But over 229 years, there have been only 25, or maybe it's 26, 25 amendments um, to the Constitution, and uh, it has stood up reasonably well uh, through that. And one of the things I think would be uh, interesting and fun is you could teach an entire U.S. history course just on uh, the amendments to the Constitution. Um, you, could, you could take a look at what, what caused those first 10 amendments to be passed, what caused those Civil War amendments to be passed, what caused prohibition to be passed, what caused the repeal of prohibition to be passed. You could have a pretty interesting course just on, just on the amendments. Uh, it has largely worked. Well, it has largely worked because of the universal acceptance of it. Uh, so when we talk about the Supremacy Clause, um, that's great, but if the president is the commander in chief of the army and rolls out the armed forces and shuts down Congress and shuts down the press, the Constitution is simply a piece of paper, okay? So it has worked because people have honored it and because citizens have insisted that it be honored. Um, and that is uh, really the, the key to its success. And that is, the, you know, the final point is really on us, right? That this was and is an experiment. Uh, it still can fail. It, it hasn't, and we hope it doesn't. But it can fail if we don't do our jobs. 
Uh, and our jobs are to hold our representatives accountable. Our jobs are to write letters to the editor. Our jobs are to march when we feel compelled to march, to make our voices heard. Uh, because ultimately, you know, it's about, it's about we the people. The last slide I've got is the preamble, and it talks about we the people are, you know, in Congress assembled, are passing this Constitution to do certain things. We the people. Um, so it, it, it depends on us. So that's us. There's my smiling face. So when, you, uh, when, they, when, they, when the big shots left the room and they said, OK, we've got this document, and now we're going to send it out to the states and see if they'll pass it, um, a woman came up to Benjamin Franklin on the street and said, what, what form of government have you given us? And in a very famous line, he said, a republic, if you can keep it. So the point is, he knew, they knew, that this is a piece of paper. But if you can keep it, it's something special. And that is ultimately our job. And there's the preamble, we the people. And, this is, and then it says what the purpose of the document was, why they were doing this. In order to form a more perfect union. They knew it wasn't perfect. We're trying to make it more perfect. And we're still trying to make it more perfect, OK? Establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, common defense, general welfare, and so forth. So basically, they were acknowledging the articles didn't work. We need to do this uh, to make uh, our affairs work better. And here we are, 229 years later. We're many times the population <laughs> that we were then. We're now 50 states, not 13. Um, and the basic structure is still intact. And I've done too much talking. I'm going to let you do some talking and see what questions you have. So thank you. So who's got a yes? Yeah, did everyone hear the question? Um, yeah, OK, good. So I mean, that is, that is where we are. And it, it's a scary time. I mean, if you had a president that was thoughtful, careful, measured, understood the importance of the Constitution, understood that power can be abused, um, we might worry a little less ab about that, because there's some self-restraint um, that could be brought to bear. But that's not a word that is applied to the current office holder, right? So um, this is a scary time. Because if, I mean, Congress needs to value country over party. And we're having a hard time with that right now. It's like, hey, if you're for it, I'm against it. Uh, and that's not their jobs, but that's the way they're behaving. And sadly, with respect to the Supreme Court, we now have a situation where particularly on the Republican side, you, 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 no judge will be nominated who has not gone through a, a vetting system of the Federalist Society and a couple of other organizations that basically they know exactly how these people are going to vote uh, if they get through that process. Uh, and so we now have a polarized Supreme Court as well. So these people aren't calling balls and strikes the way I remember them calling balls and strikes a generation ago. If you go back to the Warren Court, which was what did all the uh, landmark civil rights legislation, many of those landmark opinions, Brown versus Board, Miranda versus Arizona, I mean, the really critical um, uh, rulings were often nine to zero. And how many times have you heard of a nine to zero uh, Supreme Court opinion lately? I mean, the only nine to zero opinions you hear about in today's world are boring, non-controversial things that don't get uh, covered in the news. But we're in a very strange place where a, a, a woman's right to have uh, reproductive freedom is 5-4 one way if Merrick Garland is on the court, and 5-4 the other way if Merrick Garland is not on the court. And that was a purely politically uh, a power play to deny Obama's um, nomination. I mean, that was just Mitch McConnell, you know, saying, I refuse, I'm not going to have a hearing. Um, and yet, how strange is it that the law 
changes based on something as arbitrary as you know one Supreme Court appointment. Uh, but that's that's the battle we're in right now. I mean, I'm I'm uh, I'm hopeful that we'll weather the storm. I think it would be. Regardless of one's political affiliation, I think it would be enormously helpful if one of the, at least one of the two houses of Congress were of a different party um, to at least have some accountability. Uh, because right now we're, we really don't have it. The country is being held together right now by the press, by late night comedy, and whatever protests uh, you and I uh, manage to put together. I mean that, and when and so when the president says the press is the enemy of the people. He's, he's, he's pulling on one of those few remaining threads. Um, I mean, that's out of the playbook of some pretty ugly uh, people who say the press is the enemy of the people. I mean, the press is how we get our information about what our government is doing. So every president has found it uncomfortable to read about what the press thinks about their uh, thing, whether they're Democrat or Republican or independent. They, you know, it's uncomfortable to have an editorial saying, what a dumb president. Um, but hey, that's the job, <laughs> and the public has a right to know these things. Yeah. Um, do you think it's a problem with our press that our press feels too politicized these days? Like, you like, have one news station that is 100% against somebody, no matter what, and another news station 100% for somebody, no matter what. Yes, I absolutely do. I think it's one of the really critical uh, issues that we have to address is that I, I think it's a little different in the print media. Um, and you can still discern tendencies in the print media, but they still seem to care about the basic facts and getting the basic facts out. Um, without naming names, certain television stations have abandoned any pretense about that. And um, uh, so what this means for us is that we go to our echo chambers where we feel most comfortable. And so now we don't just have different opinions. We have different understandings of what the facts are. And that is fundamentally unhealthy. And if there's one thing you can do as students is get educated and discerning about the information coming at you. Some of it needs to be discounted. Uh, some of it needs to be discounted more than others, OK? Um, I have my favorite newspapers and my favorite TV stations, but I try to tell myself, you know, don't, don't fall in love with this too much. There are other points of view. Now, there's some sources on the other side that I'm just not going to go to because I just don't think they're credible. But there are other sources that I will go to, um, and I want to see what other people have to say about that. Um, but we all need to do that. When cable TV came in, you guys are young enough that you may not remember the days before cable TV, there used to be only three television channels. And because it was such a fundamental source of information for everyone, there was a doctrine called the Fairness Doctrine. And the Fairness Doctrine stipulated that if you're going to advocate for a particular point of view on your station, you must give equal time to an opposing point of view. So you ended up with the three major networks not really taking uh, very aggressive positions on things, because if they did, they had, someone else had the right to come in and give an equal five minutes opposing your point of view. So they really did try to speak to the whole country. Um, that's why people talk with such reverence about Walter Cronkite, because he was kind of the voice of reason and sanity that both sides could listen to. When cable came in, the thinking was, well, we're going to have hundreds of channels. So more speech, more choice. People can do whatever they want. We don't really need a fairness doctrine, because everybody can just go wherever they want. I'm going to go to the golf channel. You're going to go to the tennis channel. You're going to go to MTV. And none of it matters anymore. Well, the joke's on us, because it does matter. And now we have these major news things, or organizations that purport to be news, um, that are really advocacy stations. Um, and people are getting their information from advocacy stations. And that is a really fundamentally big problem. So our job as citizens is to try to insist that they cut it out, um, or we turn off the TV and get our information somewhere else. Yeah. Just to follow up on that comment, um, I think I would notice over a couple of years the difference between reporting facts and the editorial has really blended. I would see even very credible sources. I would read an article, and I would say, that's not reporting facts. I'm expecting just facts. Mm -hmm. you can just, um, just see the opinions of the whoever was 
writing or whether you call it agenda or mm -hmm. the personal views. And sometimes you just want facts. Yeah. I mean, it, uh, that's absolutely right. Um, and what facts you choose to focus on is also uh, an editorial um, choice. That's right. So uh, one of the things I've noticed is that uh, every time President Trump gets in trouble for something, um, Fox News starts talking about Hillary Clinton's emails. Uh, so I mean, you would think we'd be done with that, right? Um, but uh, it, that's, that's because they would rather not talk about these facts. They want to distract you with those facts. And I'm sure there's analogs on the other side as well. Um, but it's, um, that's the problem. I mean, I think one of the things that cures this is get your information from multiple sources. Um, not only are, you know, going to different sides of the aisle, but uh, the Atlantic Monthly, I don't think they do this anymore. They used to have a little thing um, that they would show the same, uh, the, the same set of facts and how different headlines in different papers treated them. And it, one of the things that was really fascinating to me was even on the same side of the political point of view, you could have headlines that were radically different. Um, so you'd have the New York Times and the Washington Post with a completely different headline about what the importance of these facts were. Well, you decide for yourselves what the importance of these facts are and try as you're digesting this stuff to figure out what's, what's bias, what's fact. Uh, do, I, do I, when they say they've got, you know, they've interviewed seven sources, two of whom uh, are putting their name on it, that, that sounds like a reporter's really done some legwork. When there's no one being cited as uh, the source of this information, you know, you might say, well, where are they getting this? You know, just basically insisting that they do their jobs right. And if you're not satisfied, you know, go get two more papers and read what they're saying about the same issue. It's hard work, but it's, it's what democracy requires. Other thoughts or questions? Yeah, whoops, yeah, sorry. That's right. Um, but just the most important cases that yeah, the, to That's right. Review. The lower courts can and do rule on constitutional issues, um, but usually the losing side takes an appeal. <laughs> and eventually, it bubbles up where there's only one more court left. Now, sometimes people decide not to take that last step. And you can have what's called a circuit split, where you could have the Ninth Circuit, which covers the West Coast, has a more liberal interpretation of some constitutional provision. And the Fifth Circuit, which is Texas and Central South, um, has a more conservative one. And that we just live with that. So the states in the Fifth Circuit, you know, the, the law is one way. And the states in the West Coast, it's another way. Usually, when there are circuit splits on important issues, um, uh, it'll get to the Supreme Court. And sometimes the Supreme Court will even tell those folks, um, we'd like this issue briefed. Could you bring us a case? <laughs> uh, which is usually a signal that they've got pretty strong feelings about something that they're seeing out there. Was there another question? Yeah? I was going to ask you to talk a little bit about, um, you, you've been talking about how people all have their own opinions and that's protected. So something that um, I've struggled with professionally here at the college mm. is free speech. Yep. And that hate speech is free speech. Our general counsel has told us that. Yes, I've had students and staff criticize that my office um, has allowed a flyer by an alt right group mm. or somebody to come on campus. And I don't want them here either. However, it is free speech. So I was just wondering if you could talk about how hate speech ever became free speech. Oh, great, great question. If anyone didn't hear it, is how does hate speech become free speech? So, first point is that state colleges, state-funded colleges, um, are more closely linked to the government than private colleges. And so the rules that say the government shall not abridge free speech are more closely linked to these schools, OK? Um, but with that footnote, there are exceptions to the First Amendment. Uh, you can't call fire in a crowded theater. Okay, um, that's, that's, so, so there's free speech with exceptions, 
okay? So, I mean, you could speak for hours um, on First Amendment law, and it's a really fascinating area. But the basic dividing line is if something is inciting violence, that's not protected. If something expresses a repulsive point of view that is not inciting violence, uh, that is protected. And the ACLU has taken a lot of heat over the years because while it's on most issues a liberal organization, it has defended the right of the Ku Klux Klan to march. Uh, not that they agree with their points of view, but if free speech only applies to the people we agree with, um, well, then it just depends on who's in power at any given time, right? So the point is we need people whose voices are marginalized to feel that they can speak. Now, the issues of like the Klan or other uh, hate groups, um, I find that troubling because fundamentally their ideology is one of violence. Um, and so that line of, well, what's just opinion and what's inciting violence to me is a very squishy line. Um, so I sympathize with your problem because um, I would be inclined, as I think you probably are, to try to shut down certain types of speech. But we do so you know, at the risk of looking like we are putting our foot on the, on the political scales. I mean, it's, it's, it's a hard, one, you've just put your foot on, uh, your finger on one of the harder, harder questions in the First Amendment. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, that's, um, I don't have a good answer to that. Um, I think that, I suppose there are distinctions in some of these groups about how much do you know about what they're up to. Um, um, so, I mean, the closer you can get to a showing that this is going to cause a safety problem on our campus, or this is going to cause some of our students to break the law, um, you know, the, the safer you would be in trying to say, um, uh, you're not welcome here. The other thing that you might consider, um, there's a, an exception to the First Amendment, um, which is called time, place, or manner. Um, so without shutting down speech, you can say, look, you can't uh, come to these meetings, and you can't come to uh, these particular venues on the campus. If you want to come and proselytize uh, the, your particularly repugnant point of view, um, you can do it over um, on that corner of the campus and nowhere else. Police do this all the time. So you're having a big parade and the American Nazi party wants to march and the police will say, you're not, you're not doing it down Main Street. You can do it over here on the edge of town, but you're not coming down Main Street. Um, so you're not shutting down speech, but you're uh, moving the venue. And there may be some ways that you could play with that to say, look, you can't infiltrate our campus. Yeah? So, in agreement here that obviously white supremacists are just ugly in every single way, and especially, you know, we're, we're, we're college students, we're impressionable, we're here to learn. So, that, having white supremacist groups come on campus to recruit is particularly dangerous and concerning. And I understand that. But I think in our history, and not so very long ago, if I'm not mistaken, in the 19th Mm -hmm. And citing some of the, the things you just spoke about. And then just two years later said, and Planned Parenthood, you're not going to either, citing the very same thing. Exactly. That's exactly the problem, is that you, once you establish that principle, then it's just a question of who is in power. And uh, then you get to shut down the speech that the person in power doesn't like. Well, you know, you, you could imagine what that would be like with our current president, right? Um, so. Um, no, it's, it's, it's a problem. Uh, the, um, I mean, I thought you were going to go somewhere else with that, so let me just uh, sort of uh, follow that other thought, which is white supremacy is not a recent phenomenon. Uh, it's embedded in our DNA, uh, and we, it's the most intractable problem we have, I think, uh, culturally. And in the 1850s, there was a political party called the Know Nothings. And if you look that up, you will see a remarkable similarity to 
uh, what we're seeing right now in terms of white supremacy and white nationalism. It was an anti-immigrant, anti-elite, uh, you know, stop telling us how to live, stop being politically correct, um, stop all these liberal ideas. Um, now, it got kind of overwhelmed by the civil, it, it faded out as the Republican Party took over the anti-slavery position and so forth, and the Civil War kind of ended all that. But if you want a real analog to uh, our current times, uh, look up the Know Nothing Party. It's, it's kind of shockingly similar to what we're dealing with right now. So I know I've pressed you for time. Let's do one more. Yeah. I wish I could say yes, I just don't think it's that easy. I mean, they, they, they fell apart because other parties um, sort of emerged with more of a base coming out of the Civil War. You had the Republican Party was really the only party in power until the Confederate States came back in. The Democratic Party basically became the, the party of the South once they were back in, um, uh, and then it evolved uh, from there. Um, I, no, honestly, I think it, it you know, the, the tone starts at the top. You have to have a better and more educated and more tolerant tone at the top. Um, and then it's up to us to just be vigilant about saying, you know, what we believe in and what we want this country to be about is certain things. And it's not white supremacy. It's, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, you, our founding document, the aspirational document said all men are created equal. They didn't say all persons, unfortunately, but they said all men are created equal. That didn't mean they were actually literally equal, but it, the idea is we all should have an equal crack at this life we're describing. We should have equal chance. Um, and that's the more perfect union we're trying to uh, pull together. It's not about kicking out this group and that group and this group and that group. So on, um, uh, on that challenge to you to get out there and let your voices be heard, I'll stop there. And thank you so much and uh, celebrate the Constitution. Take care. Great. Sure. Sure.